So the title of the sermon today is Ears to Hear Amazing Grace. And the scripture reading will be from Luke 6, 27 to 38. And Mrs. Donna Party will do the scripture reading for us today. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who cause curse you, pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And for one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you, and for one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lead, lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. These are the words of Jesus to his disciples. Thank you, Jesus, for fulfilling your words found in Isaiah. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Amen. Amen. You know, as we read uh, the words of Jesus to his disciples standing on the plain, how do we take these words that are so different from what the world is teaching us? And to answer that question, we ha have to look at Jesus. We have to look at his person. And looking at Jesus, we see him. And when we look at Jesus, we see both God and man, the perfect God and man as man ought to be, as man was created to be. So before we go there, I'd just like to take a brief look at the Chalced Chalced Chalcedon Creed, which was written in 451, uh, and what it says about Jesus. I, I, I'm just going to cite a little bit of it. Uh, because if you want to read the whole Chalcedon Creed or Credo, uh, you can either do it by going to gci.org or again by doing a Google search. So this is what it says about Jesus. It says, we then following the Holy Fathers with, all, with one consent, teach men to confess one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the same perfect in Godhead and also perfect in manhood, truly God and truly man, of a reasonable, rational soul and body, co-substantial or co-essential with the Father, according to the Godhead, and co-substantial with us according to the manhood, in all things like unto us without sin. You know, when, at the first council of Nicaea in 325, uh, it was, which was written more than a, a century before, uh, the church declared that God the Father and Jesus Christ the Son were of the same substance. And it clarified that Jesus was in fact divine in the same way that the Father is divine. But the wording of the Nicene Creed specifically condemned Arianism, uh, a heresy which professed that Jesus was, was not of one substance with God, that he, that he was not God, basically, and therefore not fully divine. 
However, it neglected to address the human aspect of Jesus' identity. And so the theological pendulum swung to the other way. And new heresies emerged suggesting that Jesus, Jesus was not fully human. So they had to address this subject. And in these two credos, in these two creeds, they address two things. They address that Jesus is fully God. And in the second one, they addressed that Jesus is fully God and fully man. And uh, so this is important because Jesus in his nature is both God and man. And he became, he became fully man at the incarnation, as we know. And as we look at Jesus, Jesus, you know, what he said and what he taught his disciple was exactly how he lived. And, and as, as Jesus' disciples, we are to imitate Jesus Christ. And when Jesus said the words that we have just read in the scripture reading to his disciples, we need to realize that they had not yet received the Holy Spirit. They did not yet know, they did not have the privilege that we have of being able to read the book of Acts, nor the epistles of Paul, nor the other writings of the New Testament. They, 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 were, they, were, uh, they had the Old Testament at the time. And, and of course, they would, the apostles, they did not know fully, did not fully understand, but they would be the one who lived the reality of what it means to be united to Christ. And from them, as they are the foundation of the church, the Christ is the cornerstone, the apostles are the foundation. So it's important to, to know and to understand and to believe what they wrote about Jesus because they knew him personally and they lived with him. But the reality as we look at what Mrs. Party has just read is that we don't have it in ourselves to live what Jesus has taught his disciples. We don't have the strength to do that on our own. We must abide in Jesus as we receive God, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ through faith. We must abide in him and he must abide in us as, as, as Jesus thought. And so what he is teaching us is exactly the opposite to the reaction of unconverted people. It's really an apocalypse. It's a revelation because as human beings, that is not our tendency to live what Jesus taught his disciples in this passage of scripture. It was a new teaching for his disciples. It was a revelation because they had never heard such teaching, teaching before. And Jesus' teaching stood in opposition to the tendencies of our fallen human nature, because in our fallen human nature, we automatically stand in opposition to God and we reject his grace. That is our raw human, human nature when it's not renewed in faith to Jesus Christ. We do not accept God's grace. We reject it. We reject God himself. So again, let us stop and think about Je what Jesus is writing to us. But, and the following is, I would just like to show you a picture of, of, you know, of our foundation. And it's something that I'll, I'll describe for those who are on the telephone. Um, on the screen, there are the imperatives of response to grace proclaimed. And the imperatives are the commandments of grace. We'll love one another as I have loved you, carry one another's burden and all these. These are imperative, are commandments. And this is how we know we love God when we obey him in faith. But they're all based in the indicative of grace or the positive facts of grace. So we cannot, we are not left on our own to live by what Jesus is teaching us. We are rooted, if you will, in the rock, in Jesus Christ, in his grace. And out of grace, we are able to live by the commandments of God. 
and in faith, in the in the in the obedience of faith. So it's all rooted in grace. And so we do not obey to obtain grace. We obey because we have grace. It comes out of grace, our obedience. And this is always important to remember because as we read God's word, it's very easy for us human beings to fall back on ourselves and think we must do that alone. We can never do this alone. And of course, if we try to do it alone, it's become self-righteousness and self-righteousness stings before God. So we have to receive the righteousness of Jesus Christ re received as a gift. And then we express the righteousness, the gift of righteousness received from Jesus Christ. That is what is acceptable to God. It has to be in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the center of everything in that way. Um, and, and, and being united to Christ, it's important to, to say, does not mean that we become Jesus. <laughs> does not mean that. We remain different from Jesus. We receive from him the grace and the willingness to do his good pleasure, always rooted in God's love. So what happens is that just the, in the oneness of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the three persons remain distinct. And we, in Christ, united to Christ, we never lose our identity. You will always remain who you are. But at the resurrection, you'll be the perfect you. And now we have received perfection from Jesus Christ. And we live in the in-between times, so we're not yet perfect in the flesh, but in Christ, where our identity is hidden, we have been made perfect and we have received that gift. So that is the gift of, of grace. And these teachings are not forced on us. We are to receive them and by God's grace, except to respond in faith to his teachings. And I know there's part of Christianity that say, you know, you don't have any choice. Uh, you know, God is going to, if, he, if God wants you to be saved, he is going to save you whether you want it or not. Well, that is not God's love. And, and there's evidence in the Bible everywhere that we always, it's a relationship. So we have, we can, we respond to our relationship in Jesus Christ. So that is important to understand as well. And and we have received the, the Holy Spirit as a guarantee of our inheritance. So what we do is, as, as God's people, is that led by the Holy Spirit, we live in the obedience of grace. Because grace teaches us certain things. So let's look at the teachings of Jesus Christ a bit more closely. He said, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies and do good uh, to those who hate you. And the introduction to this part of the teaching to the disciples is, but I say to you who hear. And with God's help, we need, his, we, we need him to open our ears to hear what Jesus is telling his disciples in this passage of scripture. We are not to shut our ears to what God is telling us. Because what he's telling us is really revolutionary from a human point of view. Because we live in a divided world. And when Jesus lived on the earth, there were divisions between the Romans and the Jews. There were divisions between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. There were revolutionaries back then as well who tried to overthrow the Roman government. And when we think of history, we, we can ask, well, does it remind me, does that remind us of what is happening in our world today? Well, indeed it does. And today we live in a time when there are many divisions in politics. We have the liberals, we have the conservative, we have the NDP. And by design, there is opposition embedded in our constitution. And the COVID-19 is raising divisions among people as 
was never expected at the beginning of the pandemic. We never expected that it would come to this level. You know, people have different views about vaccination. They have different views about a whole lot of things. And in our world, there are divisions about a whole lot of subjects. And we need to remember in all of this that Jesus did not come to the earth to condemn, but to save everyone who would place their faith in, in him. God never condones evil. In fact, he hates evil. There is no evil in God. And although Jesus took our human nature when he came to the earth, he never sinned. He lived what he preached. His relationship with God the Father was perfect. He lived vicariously for every man, woman, and child. He lived for us in our stead in perfection. He's our creator different from us, and yet he became the same as us when he came to earth as one of us. That is why when he died on the cross, he did take our place. Because when we think of it, if Jesus had not come to the earth, being sinners, we would all be dead. <laughs> there would be no hope. The grave would be the end. And because of Jesus Christ, the grave is not the end. And when we look at the division of our world, just in our lifetime, it didn't happen, just didn't happen yesterday. Or, you know, I, I remember about maybe 15 years ago, we went to one of, one of the provinces in Canada and uh, we went to a rodeo. And um, I had never gone to a rodeo before. But at that rodeo, there was a straw man who represented the prime minister of Canada at the time. And they had bulls run at this prime minister in, in, in complete disrespect and, and, and condensation, uh, condemnation and, and ridicule. And yet God asks us to pray for our leaders. Co completely different attitude that, that we are called to have uh, from this world. And, and Jesus, we need to remember, hates evil. He hates evil. He died because of evil. And we need, with God's help, we need to, we don't hate sinners, but we hate evil. Jesus does not hate sinners. He came to save sinners of whom we, we are, of whom we were be, before he changed our identity when we came to faith with, in him. But we are to have the same attitude as he has. We have the mind of Christ. And Jesus tells us what? He tells us to love our enemies. Not with any kind of love, but with his love. It's the agape love, the love of God, his love, which he pours out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And, and the love of God is very clearly defined in 1 Corinthians 13. The love of God is kind. It's humble. It's not rude. It's not selfish. It's not easily angered. It's not uh, resentful and, and irritable. God's love does not rejoice at injustice and unrighteousness. The, the love of God rejoices with the truth. God is truth. That is where we, in a world of disinformation, we need to look to God for truth. And the love of God believes all things of God. Hopes in all things of God. Endures all things patiently by the power of God. And because Jesus is God in the flesh, you know, he is love. He expresses perfect love. He died for us when, when we were still his enemies. And we, had, we need to own that. Jesus died for me because I was his enemy. And he made us his friend. You know, at the right time when God came into, into our time, broke into our time, just at the right time in the person of Jesus, Jesus was hated. 
it, it began at his birth. We, you know, it, it, he was, they tried to kill him. And, and while he, at the end of his life on the cross, while he was jeered and had a great deal of suffering physically, emotionally, spiritually, Jesus never condemned anyone. In fact, he asked for forgiveness for those soldiers who were gambling his clothes. He said, he asked God the Father, he says, forgive them for they do, they do not know what they are doing. And we see the same attitude of, of the apostles on the day of Pentecost. You know, when they preached, when the Holy Spirit came down, what did they do? Did they condemn people in their preaching? No, they did not. The apostle Peter pointed them to Jesus. And he, the apostle Peter, asked those present in Jerusalem to celebrate, who had come to celebrate the, the, uh, the, the Old Testament Feast of Weeks. He asked them, he, he told them, repent and save yourself from this crooked generation, as we read in Acts 38 to 40. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive what the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are afar off, everyone whom the Lord God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourself from this crooked generation. The Apostle Paul calls it this present evil world. Did Peter hate the hate people in the world? No, he didn't. But he hated the evil and, and he asked Christians as they repented, leave this world system. You live in the world, but do not adopt the values of the world that are contrary to what G that, that are contrary to Jesus. And we realize we and 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 God loves the whole world. It's abundantly clear in Jesus Christ because Jesus died for everyone. But not everyone is united to Jesus in faith yet. Many people don't believe. And the revelation, the, the generation he lived in, as well as ours, is said to be a crooked generation. It's that is the reality of how the Bible describes it. And it takes balance, doesn't it? To be able to love people and not love the sin. But this is the attitude that God has towards every human being. And we are to have the same attitude as Jesus Christ to all those who we perceive as being enemies, whoever they may be. And as we have occasions, we have to, go do, to do good to them. And this is a reflection of the mind of God the Father. And we, re we read that in, in Matthew 5.45, and we have just read it in, in Luke, in, Mar in, Mark, in Matthew 5.45, it says, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good. And he sends rain on the just and the unjust. Do we love our enemies? You know, rather than hoping something bad will happen to them, do we pray for them and hope that God will open their minds to God's grace and their need to repent of their alienation from God? Because our hope for them ought to be the same hope that Jesus has towards us and towards everybody so that they will receive this gift of reconciliation. And when the occasion presents itself, itself we are to help them in practical ways as well. And we are not to de dehumanize them by calling them names, by being condescending, etc. You know that we are to see others through the eyes of Christ. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. Bless those who curse you. It means to speak well of those who curse you. That is what the, the Greeks basically says. 
we are to pray for those who abuse us. In other words, we are to pray for those who mistreat us, who are cruel towards us. And the King James translate it as those who despise, despitefully use you. And in more modern language, we would say we ought to pray for the bullies. We ought to pray for the bullies. And this attitude is certainly not an attitude of weakness rooted in fear. It's not rooted in ourselves, but it's rooted in, in on the rock, in the love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the source of our inner strength. And he is the one who enables us to have that attitude. And as human beings, we want to rationalize. If somebody treats us badly, our human reaction is to defend ourselves and to, to, to give back what they give us. But this, we are, instead, we are to pray for them, Jesus says. And in faith, we are to participate in the expression of God's love towards the most difficult people. We are to hope that one day, they will also repent and turn to God. Now, this does not mean that we put ourselves in harm's way. We have the example of Jesus. You know, it was not his time to die. And when they wanted to throw him off a cliff, what, he, what, what did he do? He disappeared in the crowd. They couldn't find him. He, 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 he did not expose himself to abuse at that time. And we had the example of the Apostle Paul, for example, who called on, the Roman, on his Roman citizenship to avoid falling into the hands of the Jews who wanted to, to murder him. They wanted to kill him. And so just to make it clear, we do not have to stay in abusive situations if we can avoid it. But there are times, you know, when we face situations that are abusive, and we have to face it. And this does not mean that we place ourselves in harm way when we can avoid it. Again, we are led by the Holy Spirit. And when we face those situations, we look to God through prayer. And then we, and as we, we, we seek wise counsel as well. In Proverbs eleven fourteen, it says, where there is no guidance, the people falls. But in abundance of counselors, there is safety. The abundance of counselor of other disciples and um, who may be able to help. And sometimes even people in the world can be a source of help. But it's always we need to realize that, you know, we it's good to get advice when we're in situations like that, and just not to keep it to ourselves and so, so we need to pray for God's wisdom in those situations. God, Jesus is our wisdom. And our attitude towards those people who treat us in that way is not to return evil for evil. Evil begets evil. We are to return good for evil, the Bible teaches us. We are to bless them and not dehumanize them. We are to pray for them. A simple ex example, if somebody insults me or you, how do we respond? Well, sometimes we don't say anything. We bless them in our hearts and pray for them. And sometimes we respond by kind words. And uh, <laughs> so this is... You know, and God will lead us as we trust in the Holy Spirit in those situations. But the fact is, you know, we know that we have God in us and he gives us the strength to have that attitude of love towards others. And the question we can ask, do I have ears to hear what is Jesus telling me in those situations? You know, the one who strikes you on the cheek offered the other also. And from one who takes away your cloth, do not withhold your tunic either. I would just like to quote from the, uh, 
the pulpit commentary on verse 29 here, uh, because um, it says, this and the following direction is clothed in language of Eastern picturesque to drive home to the listening crowds, the great and novel truth that was, ur that was urging upon them. No reasonable, thoughtful man would feel himself bound to the letter of these commandments. Our Lord, for instance, himself did not offer himself to be stricken again, as we read in John 18, 22 to 32. Uh, where we read uh, he was standing before Pilate and he said, um, if what I said is wrong, when he was said, when, when he had said these things, one of the officers standing by, by struck Jesus with his hand saying, is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, if, if what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? And so Jesus faced that man. And so, but again, and we have the example of the apostle Paul in John, in Acts 23 and verse three. And he never dreamed of obeying the letter of, of, of this charge. In fact, if you read the whole of Acts 23, you'll see how wise Paul was in his reaction to the accusation that was given against him. And what we read about turning the other cheek is, and so with the exception of very few mistaken fanatics, all the great teachers of great, Christianity have understood this because Jesus taught often in, in images. He talked in analogies and parables. And, uh, you know, I, we have other examples that we don't take literally. Um, you know, for example, in Matthew 7, 3, he says, why do you see the specks that is in your brother's eyes, but do not notice the log that is in your own eyes? <laughs> you know, so... We don't, it's, it's an image, it's, it's, a, it's to drive home a point, an attitude. Um, you know, the other person does not, I don't have a, a literal log in my eye. And the other person does not have a literal speck in his eye. Or again, there's another example in Matthew 18, 9, he says, and if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell, the fire of hell. So again, does Jesus ask us to gouge out our eyes? Literally, of course not. It reflects an attitude that we are to run away from temptation. We are to run away from sin. We are to take strong actions to avoid it. This is what it means. And uh, so again, Jesus did not always turn the other cheek. He did not in the example that I just gave you. And uh, so give to everyone who begs from you and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. So this is the, the, the same principle. Again, if we look at the uh, pulpit commentary in verse 13, 30, says, here again, it is clear that faithfully to cling on the literal interpretation would be utterly to ignore the true spirit of the Lord's word, where he sets forth his sublime, sublime, sublime ideal of charity, which ignores its own rights and knows lo no limits to its self-sacrifice. So he's talking about self-sacrifice. He's talking about, about what it means it's uh, and we'll see it he'll expound it in the next verses so again uh, we are not to take those things when it's there are things we take literally in the bible and then that there are things that we take that are written in analogies images and we are to take it that way so we have to make the difference 
And obviously during Jesus' time, they used, Jesus is not literally a door, but it's an image of a door that it's by him that we enter the kingdom of God. And Jesus is not literally a shepherd. And we are not literally sheep. But you, God uses the analogy of how loving he is towards his, his people. And how we are like sheep and we are safe in his hands. So, you know, we, we, we need to to make those differentiation as we take, uh, as we read the Bible and get to the, the main point. What the Lord incalculated here was that broad, unselfish generosity, which acts as though it really believes those other beautiful words of Jesus, that it is more blessed to give than to receive. This is the point that Jesus is making. It's more blessed to, re to give than to receive. And then we read, in Luke 32 to 36, if you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. But if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful as even as your father is merciful. Again, in verse 32 to 34, it, it reflects ordinary human behavior. But Jesus is calling us, his disciples and learners, to a higher standard than those who are unconverted. There's nothing wrong in loving those who love us. <laughs> it's not as, it's a good thing. But Jesus goes beyond that to extend the love, his love to people who are difficult to love. And again, it's very stretching. It's not, it's not, it's, it's not, it, we need God's help to be able to do that. So Jesus is teaching us how to react to those who do not reciprocate love. So again, when we lend to an enemy, to someone who does not like us, we cannot, and we need to remember the principle that we cannot lend what we do not have. If we lend to anybody, to an enemy, for example, we need to be ready to depart from that, from, from what, we, what we lend. But we cannot lend what we do not have there's a balance there we we it's the same as when we give to god we give according to our abilities with a cheerful heart if you will uh and it may sometimes it may be time it may be a whole lot of things uh, kind words and but here he's talking about the principle of money just to make the point that we are to be givers and again, this attitude is rooted in God because God is kind to whom? He's kind to the ungrateful, to the ungracious, to the evil, or to the wicked, to those who are malicious and slothful and lazy. And we see, we see this in the attitude of Jesus Christ. I'll just give you an example. In Luke 17, where he healed 10 lepers. And... Uh, what happened is that he healed them. He did, told them to go and to the synagogue. And, uh, but there's only one who came back. And the one who came back was a foreigner. He was a, uh, a Samaritan. And um, he said in verse 18, was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And when Jesus healed them, all these 10 people, he did not say, well, do you deserve to be healing, to be healed? You know, why are you? he did not barrage them with all kinds of questions? What he did, he just healed them. And one came back and said, thank you, and recognized that he gave back, he, he gave praises, he gave praise to God for it. And it was a powerful lesson because 
the Jewish people had a very condescending attitude towards the Samaritan and the Gentiles. And the principle that is talked about here is that we are to be good neighbors to people, whether we like them or not. We are to treat them as we like to be treated. And judge not that you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. And uh, so we are not to judge or condemn anyone because God is ju the judge and we are not. But does it say that we are not to recognize what is evil and sinful? No, it doesn't say that. Because in John 7, 24, he says, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. So we are to, we have to have discernment. We have to know and, and be guided by Jesus Christ in that sense. And, and we don't park our minds at the door when we become Christians. You know, we are to love God with all our minds, hearts, and all who we are. But we are called. God wants us to recognize what is evil. We are called to live in the world. We are commanded not to join the unconverted in sinful behaviors. Because from being in darkness, in Christ, we read in Ephesians that we have become, we were darkness before, becoming like uh, united to Christ. And Jesus says that we have now become light. And Light has fruits, good fruits, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And we are to see others through the eyes of, we are not to see others through the eyes of the flesh, but through the eyes of Jesus, again, who desires everyone. He died for everyone. The desire of God is that everyone will come to repentance, or even some will not, but th that is God's desire. And whether or not people know it, they have been forgiven at the cross. Everyone has been forgiven at the cross. Their, their status has changed in Christ. You know, spiritually speaking, we are no longer descendants of the first Adam of fallen Adam, but we are spiritually descendants of the last Adam of Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone. Everyone is included in Christ. But not everyone is united to Christ at this time. So that's important to, to realize. So how can we condemn anyone when we are cognizant of the fact that of what Jesus did for all humanity? In, in 1 John 2, 2, he says, he is the appropriation for our sins and not only for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. He paid the sin of the whole world. He took away the sin of the world. So united to Christ and in his love, we, have, we are to have an attitude of forgiveness towards others rather than an attitude of condemnation. And secondly, given it will be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So God is a generous giver. He has given us his son. Jesus Christ voluntarily gave us himself for us. And he took our punishments, our rightful punishment. He took it on himself and he died our death so that we could have life. There's no greater love. And having the mind of Christ, the message that we are to, is that we are to be generous. We are to be a generous people in the service of others in the service of God, and in the service of others. And we are to be responsibly generous in sharing what we have been given, generous with our time, generous with our words. We have received tremendous grace, and we are to share that grace. And in summary, I'd just like to show you a scripture that captures all of this in 2 Corinthians 9, colon 7, in verse 7. It says, each one must give as he has made up his mind. Each one must give as he has made up his mind. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, 
for God loves a cheerful giver. So what we have read today speaks about God's amazing grace, which is as God's people, we are to share and extend to others as God enables us. And for a final hymn, I'll just, we are going to sing uh, Amazing Grace. And uh, I would just like us to think about the grace that we've received and how we are to share that grace with others. Because that's what Jesus did. That is what Jesus does. And we've been called to proclaim his greatness.